Alan, I have followed the philosophy of reductionism my whole scientific uh, career and, and personal interest as opposed to irreducibility. When do you are able to reduce things to its lowest possible level in physics? Uh, and when, and it, is it the case that there's ever a, 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 a floor to where something becomes irreducible in scientific explanations? So let's start with understanding what reductionism is. I have a long-term simplistic understanding that you can reduce it to quantum field theory or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but are there different ways of thinking about reductionism? When most people think about reductionism in the sciences and in biology in particular, they envision something like everything is reducible to molecular behavior or fundamental physics along those lines. However, scientists don't just look at systems and discover that they are reducible in that way. It's quite complicated to represent those systems and then connect representations at one level to representations at another level. So as a philosopher, what I try and do is move away from what's sometimes called an ontological notion of reduction. Uh, we are nothing but molecules in motion to say, how does a scientist represent, investigate, explain how some higher level behavior is connected to the behavior. So it's like a meta-reductionism, looking at the process of thinking about reductionism. Right. We might call it reductionism in practice okay. rather than reductionism in principle. <laughs> when I say, okay, maybe one does think everything is just molecules in motion, but how do you show it? How do you really demonstrate that? as a scientist. So within philosophy of uh, science, we make a number of kind of standard distinctions, such as the difference between methodological reduction and epistemological reduction or explanatory reduction. Because I might want to investigate a system at the lowest possible level, but that doesn't mean I necessarily think I can explain it at that lowest possible level. And I can have ways in which I might want to explain it at that lowest possible level, but might be investigating it at another level. And so the, there, you can have differences between methodological reduction and epistemological or explanatory Are reduction. Are you differentiating then between epistemological reductionism and ontological reductionism right. as well? Right, exactly. So there are three ways So, to so think three about different it. ways of thinking about that. And they don't have necessary implications. That's the crucial uh, feature. You can be thinking about ontological reduction in one way that does not force you to think about epistemological reduction in another way. So let, 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 let's dig into this so we understand. It. The ontological reduction is, I mean, it, it, one says is, that's the way it really, really is in, in reality. That's its being, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how it is now. Epistemological means what can we know about it? Because maybe it is that way, but we can't know about it. Right, exactly. And that's why I said reductionism in practice versus reductionism in principle, because we might be committed to a particular position uh, on the ontology, but the actual scientific demonstration of that is very, very difficult and is interesting to look at from the perspective of a philosopher. How do scientists yeah. actually try and establish that some behavior at one level of organization, say the level of the organism, is just only what's going on at some lower level, say, that the molecular details. That there's no uh, uh, irreducible principle at the organism level, to use your example, yeah. that is needed to explain the, the, the set of facts. Right. And right. how do you prove that? Right. And, and recognizing that when you look at scientific practices, scientific practices reflect a tremendous heterogeneity of these commitments about what counts as the relevant lower level parts that you need to pay attention to. Mm. Some scientists pay attention to biochemical parts. Some scientists pay attention to cellular parts. Some scientists pay attention to particular molecular components. All of those are valid, but they're not the same. And we can't simply assume that they translate between one another because the conceptual schemes that scientists use to do those analyses differ. 
some scientists would say, I might have said in some time in the past, what you say is true, it doesn't make a difference. Because what I'm doing is we're all trying to get to the same thing. How we're doing it doesn't matter. Are you all trying to get to the same thing? Mm -hmm. That's what I think is less clear to me. As a philosopher over time and looking at the way scientists work, mm -hmm. it's not at all clear to me that everybody's going after the same thing. And in fact, if we think that, we might end up being confused and mistaking what one group is doing compared to what another group is doing by assuming that they're trying to do the same thing. Example? Well, so a classic example is in the biological sciences where you might say, I've got two different groups who are investigating the genetic properties of a particular system. It does not mean that those two groups are equally committed to the genetic properties being the most important properties to pay attention to in the system because one party might think that that's the easiest way to get started on the analysis of a complex problem and you might have another party who thinks that's where the action really is. Mm. From the outside, it looks like they might be doing the same thing, right, so right, but in right, fact, right. very differently motivated. Right, because in one case, the, for example, the level of selection to take a, an evolutionary situation, some would believe that it's only, only the genes and that everything is following the, the genes. Others would say no, that there are different levels of selection. And, but they, bo they both might be investigating the same genetic activity. Yes. And you, so you don't know what the, 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 the individual biases or direct, directedness of their theories are. Right, which is why I would advocate that philosophically we pay close attention to the actual practices of what the scientists are mm. doing. And that oftentimes shows us that they think they're doing different things. Mm. And they, they may not know that. They may not be aware of it, and right. that's sometimes an advantage to being in conversation with the scientists because you might make an observation and say, I think I see you doing this. And they might respond by saying, yes, I am, but I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> and you kind of bring words to capture the behavior that they're already engaged in as a scientist. How does reductionism articulate with emergence? So reductionism has traditionally been thought of as the opposite of emergence. Right. People have thought, oh, not reductionist equals something is emergent. However, once you bring in these distinctions about different kinds of reductionism, um, and in fact, you can do the same thing for emergence and talk about different kinds of emergence, you end up with all kinds of interesting complex patterns where systems can be simultaneously reducible and emergent at the same time. And the way they are turns out to be really interesting, but also turns out to be very local. It turns out to be something that you have to be paying attention to specific mm. details of a system mm. to understand. Mm.